Hey, I'm McRocklin, and you're listening in time. Right. All right, cool. So, uh, what's up, everyone? We're uh, we're great to be in the uh, presence of McRocklin, who's um, Steve Vai once cited him as the Mozart guitar, has played alongside Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, Zach Wilde, Steve Lukather, amongst many other greats. So, um, how you doing, McRocklin? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you guys? Very good, thank you, mate. Yeah, spot on. So, awesome. uh, let's uh, let's start from the beginning. I mean, you're like, are, are we are we safe to use the word child prodigy? I think you you've been playing from a really <laughs> age. Yeah, I mean, I guess it all kind of started out as that. Um, I mean, I first started playing the guitar when I was like four years old, and it was just by chance. It was my dad's guitar, and he would go to work and when he was at work, I'd kind of grab the guitar from behind the TV. And eventually, I, I guess he got kind of sick of uh, seeing his guitar on the floor and then, you know, taught me a, a couple of guitar chords. Yeah. Um, but it's just like anything, when you get those first chord changes right and it feels, you know, like you're actually making a sound that sounds right, it's like you get that total buzz from it. Um, but I guess, you know, my, my first big break came when I was eight years old and I opened up for Ozzy Osbourne in my hometown in Newcastle. And ever since then, it was just kind of like a wild, crazy ride for many, many years until I kind of left the music industry. So um, I guess, yeah, eight is when it all kind of kicked off and I started doing a lot of TV. And it, initially it was back and forth to London. And then it would kind of start going to the US when I started doing... Uh, things like the Nam show and uh, different shows over there and working with different brands but yeah so I find it <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh obviously uh you used to pick up your dad's guitar was um was your dad a musician as well or was it kind of just more like a hobby he was more just yeah he was into rock you know he was into like led zeppelin uh black sabbath and Aussie and stuff and which i really got into as well you know we used to go kind of driving around listen to like the latest Aussie record and the latest van halen stuff at the time you know um but he was probably just more of a you know a hobbyist you know he was into guitar enough to to kind of have one in the house but um i think it was just more you know a sort of an enjoyment thing from him. he wasn't like a, a real sort of uh, serious musician my granddad actually actually was like really an incredible uh, accordion player um but uh, but my dad always complained he couldn't play solos <laughs> <laughs> So uh, maybe I'm making up for for that from now, huh? <laughs> so um, with the uh, with you said you played Ozzy Osbourne at uh, when you were eight years old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like how how did that actually come about? Then were you like playing like jam sessions in your local? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it was just a lot of luck and a lot of hustle, you know, from from my dad's point of view because a lot of the time. You know, he'd sneak me into bars and clubs that I really shouldn't have probably been in. And then I'd be hiding behind a Marshall stack and then I'd come out from behind the Marshall stack and I'd blast for like five, ten minutes until the bar manager was like, all right, you know, the police are going to come now and get, get out. You know, and we, we, we do that sort of stuff quite often. And it was always fun. So I can't remember the specifics of how we got in the venue, but it's very likely that we were kind of outside the backstage entrance and bear in mind, like when I was a kid, I was like dressed head to toe in leathers and I had, you know, big guitars, cowboy boots that were like four sizes too big for me and all, and all that stuff. So I probably stuck out like a sore thumb. And then often what would happen, and this happened in, in Donington 88 uh, when I first met Steve Vai, is, you know, the guitar tech or somebody from the crew would spot this little crazy looking dude and they'd say, you know, hey, come, come on in. Uh, Ozzy would want to meet you. And and then I remember actually uh, with the Aussie thing, actually, uh, come to think of that, uh, we got invited to go in to see the sort of sound check. And then I went up on the stage afterwards and I started playing guitar. Aussie kind of freaked out. And then next thing you know, I was opening the show that night. So it was like <laughs> just crazy. Just But lots of stuff like that, you know. I mean, I think, um, you know, the right place, the right time and stuff, you know. <laughs> Funny. It's really interesting. It's like it's such a unbelievable accomplishment at such a young age like how like we we could never imagine something like that it's so crazy i know it, it's a weird thing it's um i mean i think you know you, my dad's such a big personality and i think you know once he believes in something he's kind of just going for it you know full on so 
um, yeah, I think just the two of us together, we, we, we did so many trips to London and to the U.S. and stuff. And, you know, it was just, um, he was just always pushing himself, I guess, out of his kind of comfort zone because, you know, in his mind, he was just like a normal guy from Newcastle. You know, you never thought you'd be sitting on a board meeting with like the guys from Interscope Records who are now on the board with Apple and kind of working, you know, and all these kind of crazy things. It was just like, every day was like an adventure. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the Bad For Good uh, record, you've had some, you, you played along some great names uh, with that as well, but then you went on to do a, uh, a solo instrumental album, 91 to 95. Yeah, uh, I'm. This is this is going back a while now, but I mean, like, so you you went from having you know heavy heavy rock say with uh, a vocalist to yeah. then going on to do an instrumental album. How was the like the songwriting process between the two? Yeah, I mean, the bad for good songwriting it was was really interesting, and then you know that kind of band approach was Steve. I had a lot of ideas already um, for for the project. Um, so just to give you a little bit of kind of insight on how Bad For Good formed, and basically I signed with Interscope Records when I was like 11 or 12, and then one by one we kind of gr gradually formed the band. So my dad discovered Brooks Wackerman at one of the NAMM shows and then kept in contact, and then he later found the bass player, and then the record label found the singer. And then after the band was kind of pretty much there, um, I'd already done stuff with Steve Vine, like the audience is listening, um, so Interscope had asked Steve to come on to kind of produce and record and help out with that side of things. So Steve already had like a bunch of songs already written. By this time, I'm like 11 or 12 or so. So I've, I'm kind of really into playing and have a lot of ideas myself. Um, so there's tracks like um, instrumental tracks on Bad For Good, like Tire Kick In and Curious Intentions and a lot of other kind of riffs that are from my sort of side of things. And a lot of it was from, uh, a lot of the record was written by uh, Steve Vine. Um, but because like shred guitar was always something, you know, I was really, that was my thing. I, I already had like a lot of ideas that would really work later on for the instrumental music. Um, so when I came back to the UK, it kind of felt more natural to kind of just get all of that instrumental side of things out of me. But by this point, you know, my musical taste was already starting to just deviate away from guitar. And the 91 and 95 things, records was like the last thing I put out before I just completely almost well yeah completely ditched the guitar and then got into electronic music and just nothing to do with the guitar it was just like instant switch off you know very very quickly anyway i mean that was that was pretty like i suppose a, a harsh turn for things you know just going from playing guitar being so such a prominent uh figure for uh, as a guitarist but then going into a completely new realm i mean you, you listen to a lot of music now and there's a lot more of uh uh it's a lot more production based than it is um, live instrumental based, I'd say. Yeah. But was that something you saw coming or was that just something that like, just completely piqued your interest and you're like, all right, I've. This yeah, is I mean, I was always really interested in the studio side of things. So when I was living with Steve I making the record, you know, I'd be always quizzing him how to use the mixing console and he explained how to use the mixing desk in a really kind of cool way. It was like, all right, so how do you use the buses on a desk? And he's like, you'd explain it like it was buses going down the track because I was like a kid at the time. <laughs> but but the gear side of things was always like something I was really interested in. And I was fortunate enough to be in a lot of um, really cool studio sessions in LA uh, and just kind of keeping an eye and just listening to guys like Jimmy Iovine who are in the studio at the time, um, who are like legendary producers and just seeing how they kind of do things. Um, and I remember one time when I came back from LA to the UK, I got my first sampler and then my first Korg workstation. And pretty much overnight, that was like, that was the start of me getting into drum and bass and hip hop and rap. And then at that time, there was no real easy way of incorporating guitar. You know, it was like, there was no like Ableton, Pro Tools, Cubase really weren't a thing other than like MIDI sequences and stuff. So there was no hybrid method. Like now when we write tracks, it's like, okay, this guitar part would sound really cool. But back then it was more like, this is your sequencer, this is your sampler. 
maybe you can get a guitar sound in the sample, but it's not like it is kind of now where you can just mash anything up and manipulate everything to your heart's content. Um, but my musical taste was like, I was really into rap music. You know, that was my, that my thing. The early 90s, you know, I was just obsessed with everything that was on like Death Row Records, which was also a part of Innescope. So I was always like more excited if I was in Innescope Records to see some of the Death Row label guys come in. I'd be like, ah, oh, <laughs> those are the guys that would freak me out, not <laughs> my guitar heroes, so to speak. So I guess from a, I guess from a production point then, um, like who would you say? So you mentioned you meant to, mentioned uh, Death Row Records. Which artist and what sort of records are you? Um, uh, I mean, I mean, The Chronic is probably. Um, I mean, that's probably my favorite record of all time you know um i love dre's sound but um i was also really into tupac and, and a lot of the uh, smaller artists that were kind of around at that time as well but um but the chronic overall is probably certainly top three records you know of all time it's just such a timeless record and you can put it on any day of the week and it's just like it sounds great and what i really like as well is like it stands up really well now but it's at a time where everything was kind of far less compressed and there's a lot more dynamics in it, um, which is, you know, it's like a really important thing. And I think things on a production level are starting to ease off a little bit, you know, in terms of like how much dynamic range is in modern music. It's starting to kind of chill out. A couple of years back, it was just like everything was produced for volume. It was just like chaos, you know. So I guess for like you mentioned timeless records as well. What what do you reckon uh, contributes to becoming a, a timeless record? I'd imagine part of it's you know has to be a, like um, relevant to the time where it's well it's got to be timed quite well anyways. But um, yeah, I think I mean the songs are great. You know what I really like about it with in particular about the the Chronic album is the drums are great, but there's also loads of like jazzy synth stuff that kind of just goes on throughout the tracks and like even some of the synth synth lines that are on top of the record are really quirky but really melodic and really jazzy and so it's it's not like a lot of two bar loops kind of put together and that that's the, the track you know it's like they had this kind of jazz fusion stuff even when you listen to some like the warren g stuff they've got those really cool fender road sounds going on and it's just adding another sort of dimension to like hip-hop and rap so yeah, I think it's just a, a bunch of things and just everything, you know, came together, I think, with that record. And um, I'm going to listen to it today. You know, that's it. You know, that's going to be the rest of my day. <laughs> it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you were quite the fan of um, rap and hip hop. But were, like, obviously, now you've got McRocklin and Hutch and that's like such like a cool, unique, experimental electronic oh, guitar right. and synthy kind of sound. It's like, so where did that kind of... Obviously, like you said, you mentioned rap, but where did that other kind of more synthy, kind of jazzier, electronical vibe come from? Yeah, so when I started playing again, um, I kind of started picking up the guitar like 2016 and, uh, and then 2017. That's when I started getting really serious. And one of the genres that I quickly really got into uh, was synthwave. Uh, one of my favorite bands was uh, is a band called Gunship. And I, I did a solo on one of their tracks, um, the video game Champion. And it was just such a fun genre to shred over. And it's quite nostalgic as well because it's such 80s inspired, you know, early 90s, late 80s. It's just those vibes. So it really hits home with like the time period that I was really shredding a lot. Um, and me and Hutch had known each other for a long time, uh, but we'd never done stuff together. You know, back in the day when I was really in the production side of things, um, I was mastering tracks because I became a mastering engineer and then he would make all these tracks with various artists and then send them over to me to master. But I've never, we, but we never worked together. And then we both kind of clicked at the point where we were both listening to Synthwave and I'd just done the stuff with Gunship. And then he was sending tracks over and it was just like, it was really fun to sort of shred over and play over. And then we, um, we ended up kind of releasing the first one, the second one, then everybody seemed to dig it and then that led to the the dragon force tour and more tracks and stuff so yeah fun genre to play over and it's just like i think it's just that nostalgic thing that really kind of does it you know everything you know from the music to the art the artwork is just it's so cool as well it's so like vintage yeah. inspired it's awesome um but just going backwards a little bit you mentioned you became a, um, a mastering engineer um obviously being such a prominent figure in the uh, guitar world at that point uh, when you were younger was it hard kind of like 
going away from that into this more production side was that was that a choice that you know that it was it was it quite a long process to you know to figure out whether you wanted to do that or was it kind of something like you know I need this is what, what I need to do quickly um I think everything was more my interest led so when I was into production I was kind of really wanted to make drum and bass and stuff for myself. But then I got so into the production side of things that I ended up taking on other jobs and producing other people. And then as my experience grew and grew with that side of things, the production and getting better and quicker at making things sound a certain way um, very quickly, then my attention then turned to mastering. And I think the, re the one of the main reasons is also, I really also got into playing Counter-Strike and gaming a lot around that similar time, you know, and I became like a professional Counter-Strike player. Um, so I was like, I'm right on the sort of early wave of esports. And mastering was, instead of taking on like a 60 track project and spending two days mixing somebody's project, suddenly I would take a one track, just a final mix, and then master that. And that would take like 20 minutes. So that fit really well around the gaming schedule because I wasn't playing anymore and I was killing you know, all these you know, hours on Counter-Strike. So the mastering side of thing was just like, it was just like, all right, I'm not doing any more production unless you know <laughs> I've done, it, done tracks for guys previously on the albums and they want that sound. I'm kind of just doing full-time mastering. And then started doing a lot of mastering and mastered like hundreds and hundreds of uh, records. But my favorite thing about mastering was you could just bite size work through it, you know, which worked much better, especially if you're like playing Counter-Strike so much. Something you mentioned about <laughs> Counter-Strike as well. Is that something you still follow with uh, Global Defense? Well, I, I, honestly, I have such a, an addictive personality that I have to like be really cautious so like one of the reason I, reasons i have an imac behind me and, and a lot of the stuff in here is like based around apple is like if it was windows based i'd have well you can put steam on imac but i mean I'm, i got so into gaming you know like low refresh panels you know the best graphics cards you get certain mouses mouse bungees low you know just everything is just like aimed towards that you know um playing with a wireless mouse or playing on an imac you know it's just like a disadvantage but that in itself stops my competitiveness in gaming coming through. But I'm thinking of starting a Twitch channel, and there's definitely going to be some Counter Strike playing on there as well. So I don't think. I think I'm just gonna. I, I, my wife's really worried because you know, like I was, I got married when I was like 18, and you know I was like burning all these hours on Counter Strike, being like, you know, <laughs> this loner in the bedroom playing Counter Strike. So she's worried, like, if I stop playing Counter-Strike, then I'm, I'll be, like, 10 hours a day, and there'll be no more McRockland and Hush. But I think it's just, as long as I avoid joining competitive clans, I think I can get the balance right. Yeah, yeah. I, well, well I, I, clans. good luck with that. Good luck with that. I think um, it's something I, I end up sort of sitting in between as well, as where, like, I get really competitive with games, so, um, yeah. yeah. Well, any game that has a competitive ranking system on it, I, I will lose hours. And hours. Uh, <laughs> I think that first started with me and my bro when we started playing like Mario Kart back in the day. Yeah. You know, I, like, I think that's pretty much the same for me as well. Me and my brother, we had uh, the GameCube and I had uh, an Nintendo 64 for a short time as well. But yeah, you know, Smash Bros, Mario Kart, anything you can compete on is there was a competition on it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, man. How, how would you put that back to guitar? So, like, there must be a, a, a spark inside you that is competitive by nature. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and also that was probably one of the reasons why it took so long to get back into playing because I, I went down when I was from the age of 17, 18 onwards. I went down to maybe playing 10 minutes in three months. So it was such a little amount of guitar playing going on for the, you know, for the thick end of like 20 years. So when you have that kind of mentality and that obsessiveness, knowing it, you know, and feeling every time I'd pick a guitar up, it felt awful, you know, it just felt like the, the coordination, the dexterity, the strength, Everything was just not anywhere near where it should be, you know. 
So it's like I always knew at some point if I did get into it, I'd have like a year of just like this real uphill battle that I would have to kind of push through. And that was 2016, 2017, where I kind of did that. But it so happened that I really kind of you know, fell back in love with playing again. And it felt like a less of a chore. And what I kind of thought as well is I'd use that relearning process as an opportunity to, to come back with a totally different sound. So the first couple of months, it was like everybody was like comparing me to like my self of the past and Steve Vai. And I was like, oh, shit, you know, this uh, this is not what I want. You know, I've been through that you know, previously. So then I kind of took a completely different direction and then really start working on like picking different type of sound, different phrasing. And then it was kind of really interesting because that's when the sound that I have now started to kind of emerge. Um, so I kind of used the, the time of like practicing and hard to, to sort of build myself back up as a time to really come back with a different type of sound as opposed to just trying to get to where I was previously. So that... Yes, go on, sorry. Ah, yeah, so, um, so I mean, you, you had, like, what, a 16-year break, maybe? Uh, an 18-year break? Yeah, yeah, so, easily, yeah. I mean, so, muscle memory is a huge thing. I, I had, like, a, a quite a few years break as well when I, was, when I uh, stopped playing guitar for a bit. Um, but then I found within, like, the first month of playing again, I was sort of getting close back to where I was before, and then it was a bit after that to actually try and develop the further... So you mentioned it was like it took about a year for you, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, when I look back to the early videos that I was posting like on like Instagram and stuff, um, stuff was happening, you know, for the for the casual kind of viewer, it looked yeah. like everything was just going fine. But you know, when you know you have that obsessive personality and you want to be, you know, at the peak of your abilities you know, just kind of fine tuning those things. And I wanted to really get better at like certain types of picking and stuff. So to implement these new type of techniques to be really fluent. So it wasn't something that I'd think about because I, when I'm playing, I was like just to react. And even though I went through classical and did a lot of theory exams, I never really liked to think in theory when I'm playing, I always just like to hear and react, you know? Um, so that's why I love jamming and kind of, having that back and forwards um, sort of conversation um, with the guitar, with people. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, the dexterity and for the most part to do what I could do when I was a teenager probably did take like, you know, a couple of months or so, but to really fine tune it and keep pushing, 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 um, that took the, the longest time implementing new techniques and stuff. I think this, this could be a good time to get, um, to get more into a guitar, you know, in general. Um, so you mentioned uh, there were some specific things that you were focusing on when you got back into the instrument. Like, what would you kind of say is, you know, the most like, how do I word this? Like, when you were getting back into it, the things that you were practicing, was it predominantly like alternate picking and sweet picking? Or was there a preferred style for you? And like, what, what, do, you, what do you use today? Or is it a mixture? Yeah, um, well, it's really in interesting. So when I was a a teenager playing guitars or a young kid um i was always a little bit more of a left-handed lead player i'd play with a little bit more distortion on so a little bit more legato like but the rap side of thing you know the, that that you know that that kind of phrase in rap music um i really like to phrase as if there's a, a rap or a conversation going on so now i kind of play with a little bit less gain and rely on sheer dynamics with the right hand um so i mean i don't know i have a sound that's probably a little bit of gain on but it'd be things like um so it's always difficult to come up with an example but there'd be a lot of start stopping you know so So it's kind of like this on and off sort of thing that I like to do a lot now. Um, and to do that, you kind of really have to have 
a comfort with picking but not worrying too much if you're starting on an upstroke or a downstroke, you know, so. Yeah. I've turned my vo guitar volume down because it's going to uh, feed back a little bit with the mic, so I can't really hear too much, but is that level okay for that's, you guys? That's on. It's coming. Yeah. So... Yeah, um, so a lot of picking sort of stuff um, and really kind of like heavily sort of sync stuff, like the New Beginnings EP that I released. Um, there's a track called New Beginnings on there, and that's kind of probably at, that was at the start of that type of playing, and it's probably evolved further since then. I was like dreamy sounding sort of stuff as well. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> I guess I mean we've seen I mean most hundreds of thousands of people have seen your videos on Instagram you know talking about ex uh, extending chords and how to make things sound more um, dreamy or jazzy I guess if we if you don't mind could we go deeper into the kind of nerdy stuff like what would how do you approach harmony when when composing chords and scales what what, what kind of things do you tend to use often yeah um, I mean for me um, like I mentioned before, I try to avoid the theory side of things and kind of go on sounds and then just go to the theory when I kind of need it. Um, and that all seems to work well for me. So, for example, like we could take a C major chord, for example, like this. And then we could introduce some like really dissonant sound in the middle of it like this. So that separately doesn't sound that great, but when you put it together. And then a similar thing with like a minor, we go like a minor and lift that off to get a minor seven. So we've lifted off that to get the G note and then we could octave the G note and then put the dissonant thing back in it. And then suddenly we have a chord like this. So it's based on like a familiar shape, but suddenly it sounds really different. So you know, that, that would be like an approach that I'd use. Um, and then another type of thing I'll do is kind of extend on like familiar shapes as well. So sometimes, you know, if I go to like a gain sound, I mean, this is like, how you could write something like New Beginnings, which is really complex sounding. So the, the actual riff itself is like. It's like there's a lot of stuff going on, but to go back to like the first part of the riff, so on something like that, I'd start off really simple because we just basically have like a G to A to B, and then we're really just breaking up the notes between it. And I love going to like bigger intervals. You know, a lot of people get really stuck with the same sounds and a good way of kind of breaking out of that is just go to bigger interval jumps. So that's where this kind of, you know, that big interval jump, but it's based around just a G chord. So we'll break it up. And then uh, one thing I always started, well, I used, never used to do, but now I really like doing is playing pentatonics in different ways. So instead of just defaulting to like one, four, I like to play them kind of with two and four because then we can kind of get behind the note.
and that interestingly kind of introduces other benefits. So it's, I, I love to take really simple stuff and then kind of elevate them to kind of sound really cool. Um, and I do that with cleans, with sort of riffs and stuff as well. And a lot of people are always looking for like new scales and new modes. And it's always great to know as many scales and modes as possible. But it's like, you know, we've, it's funny, we were having this conversation last night on our School of McRock chat. And somebody was saying, like, all right, give me a new uh, mode to go come up with a sound that I'm thinking of. I was like, go and um, just make the sound, but with the uh, natural minor scale. And then, um, funny enough, half an hour later, he came back with this clip, um, and he'd wrote this little piece, and it was exactly the sound that he was wanting, but was just using a natural minor. So it was just, like, a really interesting conversation. But I'm geeking out. <laughs> no, that's that's, that's 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 uh, music to my ears. That's great to hear. I mean, so like that sort of style that you've uh, developed further in the, I mean, more so in the last few years, I guess. Um, you've then implemented into McRocklin and Hutch, which I don't think I've. I mean, I suppose Dragon Force is as close as it's gotten before, but I've I've not really expected to hear like a Fred guitar over EDM or dance uh, beats, but it works. Like, w was there any skepticism before you even thought of, oh, you know what, I'm going to really uh, push this sound uh, into a different space now? I think we knew really quickly that it just worked, you know? It's like shred, you know, 80s style guitar, but now we're pushing it into a little bit more kind of modern uh, vibes as well. Um, and I think right from the first track that we, we came out with... Um, it, it just was, it just seemed to gel really well. Um, and I know what you mean, like sometimes when you put guitar into other electronic genres, it just doesn't really work or it sounds forced, you know? It's just like, uh, you could really do without the guitar. And I've tried a couple of times over the years to kind of merge the two where I've picked up the guitar and put some chords down and stuff. And it's like, it doesn't always add something to it, but I think with uh, synthwave, shredwave, in particular, it um, it definitely kind of works, you know. Um, but now we're trying to push that genre a little bit further, and um, the newer stuff is like it's a bit heavier. We've got more riffs, so instead of being like a synthwave track with some solos over the top, the tracks are forming around certain riffs. And that's kind of pushing us into a slightly darker and more kind of aggressive genre at times. But saying that, we have some really light and uh, pretty stuff coming too. Um, but it's just kind of cool how it's continuously evolving. And also, um, Hutch is now shredding on this stuff as well, because he's also a fantastic player. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, like, you've uh, last year you toured with Dragon Force, uh, supporting them as well. Uh, so with uh, finding similar artists, I guess you're Newcastle based, still, aren't you? Yeah. So, like coming coming out from you know starting from scratch almost being a, a new band and then trying to find similar sounds. How's that? I'd imagine there's not much of that around Newcastle in general. Yeah, I mean we we haven't really explored too much of the the synthwave nights and stuff because we are going to be focusing on doing like online concerts and gigs and we're kind of refining that and we have uh, like virtual sets being built and stuff um but yeah lebrock i guess is the closest um, and lebrock are awesome as well um i think they're from peter lee and uh, two other guys um two man band um and they have some really cool guitar playing in their stuff um and we got to go see them actually um probably a, a month or two before the lockdown and corona kind of really uh, became such a big problem. But uh, yeah, in Newcastle, though, um, I think Synthwave, you know, people are aware of it. Um, but it's one thing we noticed on the Dragon Force tour when we went further down south into London, you know, everybody was just absolutely going nuts for Shredwave and Synthwave. You know, it was just like, it was interesting. You know, some uh, locations, you know, further up the country, until they heard the guitars blasting, they were like, what is this? What is this? And then the guitars come in, and it's like, all right, they, they've got something that they can identify with. But in London, they kind of instantly, you know, before I even came on the stage, it was just Hutch doing the synth stuff. 
who are like really into it, you know. <laughs> um, I guess you, Dragon Force, are all such uh, talented guys, as are you and Hutch. I mean, that's such a, a stacked lineup for a show. But did you guys get to uh, spend much time together and, you know, jam out some stuff with the band? Not so much jamming, but we hung out a lot. Um, and I know Herman, um, I've only known him like maybe three or four years, but uh, I know him, you know, fairly well now. Every time I'm in LA, hopefully uh, we, we get to hang out and stuff. Um, and Herman's an amazing guy, um, such a talented guy. I mean, wh what he does behind the scenes for that band is just like astonishing, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, but he's a f true fellow geek, I mean, of the highest order. It's just unbelievable. Um, so we didn't really get to jam that much. We did actually jam on some of the shows. So me uh, and Hutch sometimes uh, would join them. I'd join them and we'd have like this uh, farming simulator section and we'd kind of go out and I'd, we'd trade country solo licks, which was fun. Um, but we'd get to hang out a lot. But, um, you know, when you're setting up a show like that and, you know, they're doing sound check and sound checks over and then you kind of, everybody has schedules, you know, it's like, yeah. It's, it's just there's just less time to do fun stuff but it was a great experience for sure i mean now we're in a sort of uh, situation where there's not really i mean we don't know when the next live gig is going to happen um but i suppose a lot of what you're doing right now i mean uh you mentioned the school of muck rock yeah uh, you do a lot of instagram posts you do a lot of youtube posts so has this actually changed too much in the way you've been operating or is it still business as usual for you yeah, exactly. I mean, fortunately for me, it hasn't really changed a great deal. It's just like, you know, it's like I'd spend an awful lot of time in this room anyway. So I'm spending still an awful lot of time. I probably just spent a little bit more time, you know, kind of learning things that I wanted to get better at. So even though we, we have like different video editors that we use and uh, a sort of team, um, I wanted to kind of get better at certain things in video production. So I've kind of, you know, been spending more time just learning stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it hasn't, you know, been too bad. Um, you know, uh, touch wood, it's just like, it's been relatively okay. You know, it's never fun going out to like a supermarket where like some people completely get it and they understand social distancing. And other people are just like kind of over your shoulder trying to grab a block of cheese. I'm like, oh, <laughs> stop, stop, back um, off. I guess it's allowed uh, the school of McRock to like f flourish completely. I mean, everyone's at home playing guitar. It's a it's a great time to uh, learn new stuff. Um, yeah, it'd be cool to find out. It'd be cool to know like how did that whole school come about and what was the inspiration behind that. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, last year I was teaching a lot on Skype. Um, and that was something I was doing, like, many lessons every evening. Um, and I noticed after a while, like, a lot of people had the same issues. They, they felt stuck in a rut. They felt like they were putting the hours in, but they weren't getting better. They weren't coming up with interesting things that they were kind of wanting and hoping to play. Um, and in a lot of those Skype lessons... Kind of, uh, <laughs> I think the police are after me. Uh, a lot of the uh, Skype lessons, basically, very quickly. Um, I mean, my, my way of teaching is I like to just go straight to the stuff that is like going to be with you for the, the rest of your life. But you get it really quickly. You know, I, I hate the, okay, you're going to learn this technique, but it's going to take three months and we need four hours of commitment every day. It's just like, no, just, just give me the useful stuff. Show me exactly how to do it. Show me the insights and then, you know, we're good. So I would try to give like as many unique insights to these guys on Skype as possible. And within half an hour often, people were doing things like 20 and 30% better. And a lot of people are just like, they just couldn't comprehend. Like they've been trying to do something for six years, for example, and then I'd point out, okay, well, the issue is, is this picking angle, this is wrong on your thumb. Now try it like this. And then suddenly it was like so much better. So because of that was happening so much, we decided to kind of come up with the school um, where we can give these really um, miniature sort of 15 to 20 minute on average lessons that are just jam packed with all the insights. So again, it's just like everything 
that's on there. It's like stuff that I've worked on for like years, but I give it away in the most not like we're not trying to make lessons quick, but we're just going straight to the good stuff, bite-sized lessons that you can consume. You know, if you're on a lunch break at work and you want to learn something fresh, you know, 10, 50 minutes on the school, and you know, we put a new lesson up every week. We also have live master classes. So even if you've watched the lesson, you've got some questions, you just don't join the master class and we can talk and go through everything in detail. We have our own chat room so people can talk about the lessons, show their new gear off, whatever. It's just full of like like minded guitar geeks. And, um, and then there's new backing tracks um, goes up every week. So it's like fresh stuff to jam over. And we have loads of uh, brand giveaways. You know, we've got a lot of brands involved with the platform um, that want to kind of help out. And we've given away like 100 sets of Daddario strings, uh, Fishman pickups, guitar effects pedals. And there's a lot of kind of exciting stuff in the works as well. So just trying to give really as many unique insights as possible, but without just kind of being mind numbly, like, you know, sitting in front of a computer for three hours trying to learn this thing. It's like, oh, hate that. So you mentioned you uh, you get involved with brands and do brand giveaways. So this actually kind of segues nicely into our um, Q&A section. So mm -hmm. Kieran um, has asked, how did you go about becoming a Kiesel artist? So I guess that's just forming, a, uh, how do you go about forming a relationship with Kiesel? Yeah, um, I mean, I think every brand has their own kind of what they look for in an artist. Um, so my kind of relationship with Keys will probably form a little bit by chance and accident. I mean, I've, I've been aware of Carvin and Kiesel for a long time. Um, but when I was playing again, I was you know, a, a, an Ibanez artist for the longest of time with Ibanez from a kid. And then I kind of wanted something that was like a really fresh, you know, kind of feeling guitar that was really kind of cool. And headless guitars is something that I really am now really into. Um, but I picked up my first headless guitar at Fishman and I kind of really got a taste for it. And then a couple of months later, um, somebody tagged me in one of Jeff Kiesel's posts and it was just like, hey, McGrath, you should check out this finish or something like that. I was like, yeah, super cool. You know, Kiesel stuff looks amazing. And then um, Jeff Kiesel messaged me and it was as simple as, do you want to check out one of our guitars? I was like, well, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's try it out. And then he sent one over, which was a, a similar guitar to this, a headless um, Osiris. And then I knew it was like that, that was the type of guitar that I wanted to play full time. It's just such a great sounding guitar. So, so some relationships with brands can be as simple as that. Um, you know, you just kind of have a, a little bit of dialogue. And at that point, you know, that was kind of, you know, my Instagram was already like probably. 80 to 100k followers I guess at that time and getting maybe three to four million views every month so you know if somebody goes to your profile and you're getting that many views it kind of makes sense that you want to put some products in front of their audience because you know if, if you're going to spend like two thousand dollars on advertising on Instagram you're probably not going to get that much mm -hmm. But for a two thousand dollar guitar or whatever it might be, you're probably going to get a lot more out of it in the long term. So that's one way it can work, you know, um, for the modern musician. But that's not the only way. Um, there is definitely other ways. So yeah, I guess um, you mentioned he sent you that guitar, and I've always thought like I've always loved looking at guitars online and thinking about dreaming about my dream guitar and what I'd love to play on stage one day. But I feel like you can't truly know until you pick it up and play, you know, whether it hot, it's the weight of it, the feel of the strings, the neck. I mean, was, yeah. that, was that an instant moment when you got that first Kiesel? Yeah, um, no, for sure. Um, the only thing that I was like, ah, with the first one was it, the body was probably like a pound or two heavier. And the, the great thing is with Kiesel is because they're just like a custom shop on steroids, you can be really specific. Like I was like, okay, I want a lighter piece of ash. For the body and so now like the way out bodies that are lighter in weight um and we can be really specific about you know kind of everything from the finish to what kind of neck we want but you know apart from the weight 
all the other guitars, they kind of just looked looked at the type of guitars I was playing and goes, okay, he's going to need this thin profile neck. I'd start playing Fishman uh, Fluence pickups, so then put the Fishman uh, pickups in there. And the rest of it, they kind of, you know, sometimes I'll spec guitars out myself, but they've every time they've surprised me with something, it's been like, I wouldn't have chose that, but I love it now. It's like absolutely amazing. So something you um, also mentioned earlier on, uh, well, uh, just a moment ago about um, social media and, you know, finding keys all through that. So something related to that, Lucas asked um, about uh, sort of maintaining your platform and keeping up with the trend and just sort of, uh, I suppose, yeah. Uh, is, is there any sort of uh, mounting pressure on, I've made, a, I've made a post today, I've got to keep committing to daily posts or weekly posts? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's really easy uh, to fall into that trap. And then you just become an Instagrammer, you know, and it's really very, very easy on Instagram in particular, and probably TikTok as well, I guess, to fall in love with the stats. And, you know, if you're growing, especially, and then you take some time out and you concentrate on, you know, maybe more important stuff like making music, um, and then you go back to Instagram, it's like, oh, I haven't grown this week. It's like, is that a problem? You know, and I think it's really, it's like, it's it's a really dangerous trap because then, you know, you, you're literally going to spend all of your time trying to make these Instagram posts. So, yeah, it's a very dangerous game uh, to, to play. And I think just trying to get that balance right is really important. Be- becoming, you know, uh, maybe an artist first that happens to have really cool Instagram content as opposed to being like an Instagrammer. Because, you know, we could all probably get hundreds of thousands of views per day if we did Beatles cover songs on acoustic guitars really well, you know, but like, that's just going to an attract a certain type of audience that's not going to benefit your actual main artist focus so it's a it's a real difficult balance that one i suppose this sort of shifts your um, your song does it shift your songwriting from like because instagram you're sort of limited to 60 second clips so uh you're sort of making like a, a, a hook uh almost instantly um, do you think that's uh, like a detrimental thing that you've had, or like not you've had like uh, just a, like? Do you think that's a detrimental thing that can happen? Um, well, I think the audience on Instagram is so in scroll mode in general that you have I think it's like zero point zero point zero three five or zero point three five seconds to grab somebody's attention. It's like ridiculous how quick people will just scroll past your post. So, so when I went from like um, my zero followers to 100k followers, and I, I really kind of pushed hard for a 12 month period to make that happen, you know, a lot of the posts that I would make would, would be super engaging, grab your eyes, you know, grab your ears. It was just like everything thrown at the wall together um, to, to kind of, you know, really make videos that popped. That would get hundreds of thousands of views. Um, so I guess the downside with that is, you know, when you post stuff that you really enjoy playing, um, not so much for me because I, I, I can't understand the game, but for people that are getting into post online for the first time, you know, so you have to understand that certain types of posts are naturally going to just get your your views up and views is exposure exposure is profile visits which is followers and then you know but you still have to play and post stuff that you really enjoy yourself as well even though it's probably going to get less views than you maybe hope unless you deliver it a certain way but it's just like i think it's just having a, a sort of an overview and, and not being too obsessed, you know, which is like really easy to do, you know, it's like you mentioned before, just once you start uh, getting sucked into stats and stuff, you're um, you're playing with fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I did that for a year. I mean, I went really hard on a year to go from like no follows to a hundred K in a year. I mean, that, that took like a lot of effort, you know, it was like, I was basically like a full-time Instagrammer, but at the same time, the reason I got into Instagram the first time is because I was practicing short 
rapid licks that played into Instagram. Yeah. So it's like, oh, 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 that's a cool lick. Let me make a video on that. And then, you know, so it kind of went hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, because this bite-sized content on Instagram, is, it's, it's huge. So like you said, to go from zero to 100,000 in a year, it clearly worked so well. And I mean, it's, it's still going now. You're still growing and got such a huge page. It's done some of the things you've achieved on Instagram is, is and generally so cool. Oh, wow. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's, that's, that's huge fans. We appreciate you coming on this uh, so much. No problem. My pleasure. Is there anything you want to um, a plug? Any? Uh, I know you mentioned your school of McRock. Uh, any new music? Yeah. So um, depending on when this goes out, on the fifteenth of this month, fifteenth of May, um, we've got a new track coming out by McRock and Hutch. It's called Black Line. That's probably the first track that really pushes into our new direction, where it's a little bit heavier. It's definitely a, a bit more a riff-based track. Um, I think it's really cool, and it, it actually uses a riff that I've had in my back pocket for probably about three years, and to finally put this riff into a track and finish it and put it out, I'm kind of really, really happy about that. So, yeah, um, you know, if, if you guys like driving at uh, 88 miles an hour <laughs> in DeLoreans on the uh, motorway, 88 miles an hour, um, 80 style, then, yeah, check out some McRockland Hutch, but otherwise, I would, um, you know, if you, if you want to push as a guitarist out uh honestly i'm not just saying this take a free trial of school of mcrock if you like it you, you know great if not it hasn't cost you anything and um you know we're really focusing really hard on it just to give you guys as much unique insights so you don't waste all those years practicing where like a couple of small tweaks new inspiration can make all the difference so schoolofmcrock.com Nah, so, um, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this podcast, uh, feel free to um, like, subscribe, check out uh, McRocklin's stuff. Um, yeah, so... We're uh, on Spotify and Apple Music now as well. That's oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much, mate, for coming on, yeah? And, um, My yeah. pleasure, guys. Thanks very much. Yeah, and it's like we've got probably the second sunny day in a long time, so might go, uh, what's it like down your way? Is the sun out or not? It is. It's all right now. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, nice. It's um, yeah, you know, in the next day or so, it's just going to be. That's it. That's the, that's the sun for the entire year. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take. Um, I have two girls, so I'm probably going to take them on their bikes for a little bit, and then uh, come back in here and shoot some videos and record some solos and get back at it. But um, but well, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Great. Really, thank you. really been good to chat to you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Take care, man. Bye. Thank you.